You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Jim Bell. Dr. Jim Bell is a past president of the Planetary Society and is currently the deputy director of the Psyche mission, NASA's journey to a metal world. Jim received his BS from Caltech in 1987 and his PhD from the University of Hawaii in 1992. In 2011, the Division for Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society awarded him their Carl Sagan Medal for Excellence in Public Communication of Planetary Science. Receiving the Sagan Medal was particularly rewarding since Carl Sagan, co-founder of the Society, was one of Jim's heroes and mentors when he was young. Dr. Jim Bell, welcome to the program. Great to be on. Now, Doctor, for thousands of years in human history, and in fact, our first exposure to the element iron was through iron meteorites, metallic meteorites. And we, humanity has used these things most of our history. There's a meteorite dagger in Tutankhamun's tomb. There was, you know, the Nama people of Namibia made spears out of the Gibeon meteorite. And I'm sure people wondered what this big crater in Arizona was for thousands of years looking at this stuff. And what were these strange iron fragments surrounding it? So we have a long history with iron from space. And now we have found a parent body of sorts for these sorts of things. You know, we see this, this asteroid, Psyche, that appears to be metallic. How did we actually determine it was a metallic asteroid? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, astronomers are, are scanning the skies all the time for, for stars and planets and moons and, and asteroids and comets, uh, small bodies. Part of that discovery process that astronomers use is not just finding out where they are, but finding out what they're like by, by measuring their colors and by measuring their spectrum, the way that they reflect sunlight. And you can compare the way that they reflect sunlight to rocks and minerals in the laboratory. And so uh, we do the same kind of thing with satellites orbiting the Earth and, and telescopes looking at other planets. And the difference with, with the asteroids is that they're just points of light. Uh, until we can get up close with the spacecraft, they're just dots in the sky. But they're not they're not uh, just gray dots, not black and white dots. They're, they're colored. They have color to them. And the color of, of Psyche, this asteroid Psyche, which orbits out between Mars and Jupiter in the main asteroid belt, the color is a lot like the colors of iron meteorites that you were just talking about, the kinds of super dense, heavy metallic chunks of rock like you find in museums and science centers around the world. You can measure their colors in the laboratory, measure their spectrum in the laboratory. And there's a lot of similarities to what's measured psyche with telescopes. So that's one piece of evidence. Another piece of evidence is that we've been able to tell, astronomers have been able to make an estimate of how dense psyche is based on its mass. And you'd say, how do you measure the mass of something out in the main asteroid belt? Well, every so often, Mars passes by Psyche. Every so often, Psyche passes by Jupiter and other planets. And every time that happens, this small body passes close to a big one or another small one that's very close, its orbit is very slightly tweaked. And if you, if you monitor it really well with really good telescopes or sp even space-based telescopes, you can measure how much its orbit is just just slightly just slightly perturbed and that is a function of its mass so its mass is roughly estimated that way over the past few decades and we have a crude estimate of its volume because the best telescopes on earth and the hubble space telescope can just sort of resolve psyche into several pixels and so it's not just a point of light. If you point the best, highest resolution telescopes at it, you can get a rough guess at its size and therefore its volume. And so if you have its mass or an estimate of its mass and an estimate of its volume, the mass divided by volume is density. And if it, if Psyche were an icy body, it would have a density near 1, 1 1.0 gram per cubic centimeter, the density of, of an ice cube. If it were a plain old rocky body like we think many asteroids are, 
common, ordinary kind of asteroids, it would have a density somewhere between two and three. If it were made of more dense material, like metal, like iron, nickel, metal, it would have a density like seven, eight, or nine grams per cubic centimeter. Well, the actual density of Psyche is somewhere between four, three, and five, three to four to five up there. So not icy, not just plain old rock, also not pure metal, but clearly there's something, there's a dense component to it. There's a metallic component to it to make that number bigger than two or three, significantly bigger than two or three. So we don't think it's a pure hunk of metal, uh, but it's also not just plain old rock either. There's a significant metallic component, maybe 50, 60% more. Who knows? We'll, we'll find out when we get close. But that was another piece of evidence that Psyche is, uh, is metallic. And then the final one is that in addition to regular telescopes, we can use radio telescopes like Arecibo when it was operational in Puerto Rico or Goldstone radar in, in California and, and bounce radar beams off of these bodies in the solar system. Even at those great distances, you can send a radar signal out and measure its reflection back. And compared to regular old rocky asteroids, Psyche's radar reflection is whopping bright as if it were that contained metallic components to it. Not quite a mirror, a metallic mirror, but metallic enough that it's bouncing back much more of its radio beam, the radar beam, than would have been expected if it was just plain rock. So all those pieces of evidence point towards a metallic world, much more metallic than anything that we've yet visited by spacecraft. Could we see a sort of differentiation there? In other words, if it's got, you know, a rocky component that starts looking like things, you know, in meteoritics, like a palisite or a mesosiderite, something like that, where you've got this high metal mix, um, could we be looking at something that is very differentiated? In other words, one side of it might be the part of the core of, you know, a planetoid, and it's mostly iron, you know, but yet as you go across the thing, you start finding material like the palisite, you know, like the palisites where where you've got olivine, you know, pervading a matrix of iron, but still high metallicity. De definitely, all these things are possible. We don't really know the answer, of course, because, you know, the that kind of detail requires getting up close, right? For our proposal, remember, this was a mission that we had to propose and compete to win. We had to compete against 25 other mission concepts to for the, for the privilege of being able to do this mission. For our proposal, we actually hired an artist and tried to tried to simulate or ask the artist to simulate what could we see? What might we see on a metallic world uh, compared to a stony, rocky world? And, uh, and he, he kind of had some fun with that, imagining what impact cratering into a world with a lot of metal might look like, imagining the, the sort of splosh of an impact getting frozen in time as that metal freezes into these uh, crowns or spires, you know, it may be fanciful, but also it's potentially possible from the, from the physics of, of what's there that, uh, that we could see some really bizarre kinds of landforms. Maybe these kinds of mixed mineral components you were just talking about, like we see in certain kinds of, of meteorites. Of course, the most beautiful samples of those meteorites that we see are very highly polished, right? Ground finely into thin sections and polished, and it makes beautiful jewelry and displays for your your uh, rock cabinet at home. We don't expect to see anything like that, right? We're looking at a natural surface that's been pounded by impacts for billions of years, so probably a lot of fine grain material there. But macroscopically, what's the geology going to look like in this place? We don't really know. And that's that's kind of exciting. An alien world in every way mm. and a new mm. new territory, you know, it's like nothing we've ever seen because let's face it, metals, <laughs> metals, a different animal <laughs> than than rock. So we may see stuff that looks nothing like Mars, you know, <laughs> Mars. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it could be simply amazing. Now, what imaging? is involved with the mission. I mean, what are we going to see as far as pretty pictures go? Yeah, we have a, we have a, a, a pretty good high-resolution camera that can get, uh, depending on how far we are away, we'll have sort of tens of meters to a few meters to less than a meter per pixel when we get really close. Um, so, you know, this is where 
from our experience with other planetary imaging, this is where the geology starts to really come alive at the 10, one to 10 meter scale. You see all kinds of detail like you'd see in an air photo taken from a, from a, an, an airplane flying over the desert Southwest, for example, you know, uh, the individual uh, craters, small craters, ridges, maybe who knows, tectonic features impact probably dominates this world. Like, like for most of the asteroids, uh, but, but because it's big and has maybe gone through some pretty a pretty violent past, there there could be other kinds of tectonic or even erosional kinds of, of features that we see on its surface. So we're using a visible light camera. It's sensitive in red, green, blue, just like our eyes. Also a little bit into the infrared because different kinds of rocks and minerals that we find in meteorites and on other asteroids have diagnostic color properties in the in the infrared and so we go a little bit into the infrared and and cover the visible wavelengths as well so we'll get some color information we're not expecting the kinds of you know crazy colors you see in the clouds of jupiter or even the rocks of mars Uh, the asteroids generally are more gray in general than um, than the planets but we we picked our filters to be sensitive to the kinds of uh, like you mentioned, olivine earlier, we've got filters that are sensitive to that mineral, pyroxene, another rock-forming mineral that's uh, fairly common in in, uh, in asteroids. We're sensitive to the the kinds of colors that we see in in uh, iron nickel meteorites on the Earth uh, that have been brought to the Earth. We're sensitive to the s- certain kinds of sulfur-bearing minerals that are also found in some of the iron-bearing meteorites, especially in in meteorites that come from places near the core mantle boundary of their previous parent bodies. So we tried to, we tried to intelligently choose our filters to, to detect things that we think might be there uh, and then have the flexibility to maybe uh, accommodate surprises as well. Now, there are people that are beginning to sort of mumble and talk about, could it be profitable to mine an asteroid? and get platinum or something like that and return it to Earth. What can this mission offer them? In other words, you know, this is our first look at a metallic asteroid, which presumably would be the first type we would probably try to mine in the far future for materials. What can it offer that? I mean, this is this is the, the first step through the door. So what does it offer? Yeah, I mean, in a sense, we're doing sort of ground truthing, if you will, of of the kinds of prospecting that astronomers do all the time all over the solar system. And uh, there are many, many of these metal asteroids all over the solar system, including some that come relatively close to the Earth. They're all much, much smaller than Psyche. Psyche is the, the, you know, the mother load of them, if you will, the biggest one in the solar system. It's way out there between Mars and Jupiter. It's not uh, in a place that would be easy to bring material back to the earth. So, you know, going out and mining psyche and bringing the stuff back is likely not practical. If ever, it might be practical to mine stuff off of psyche and use it in the asteroid belt for other settlements at Mars or other asteroids in the asteroid belt, but bringing it back to earth is probably not economically viable, but there are many more of these kinds of asteroids that are being discovered by astronomers that are much closer to the earth. And so if we can proof of concept that yes, in fact, what we see telescopically is borne out by being there much closer to that place and making the detailed geochemical measurements that we'll make with the mission, how much iron is really there, how much nickel is really there, how much of the other rock forming elements, the the silicon and the potassium and the aluminum and all the other things, the sulfur, the things that we could measure there, <clears throat> then we'll really have a good handle on what that uh, what that material is like and and maybe what other kinds of of uh, precious metals uh, might be there. And by extension, then, what the what's probably on the other very similar, but much smaller, though closer to home metal asteroids uh, that are out there. So, you know, it's, there's been, I think, maybe too much hype about mining psyche itself. I don't think that's going to be practical, maybe even into the far future. But I think we'll learn a lot about this class of asteroids by studying its most famous and largest member, 
that can be applied towards future efforts at, at, at mineral extraction in places that it's a lot easier to do that extraction much closer to home. What does Psyche offer us as far as learning more about the history of the solar system, the formation of the solar system? In other words, this object is is presumably from a much larger object that, you know, was destroyed by an impact. And that seems to me to be an end to try to probe solar system history yeah. by looking at this object. What what opportunities are there? Yeah. I mean, solar system history and more specifically the formation of terrestrial planets like our own. You know, the, the, the hypothesis is that planets start to grow from small seeds, if you will, small planetesimals that are growing as rock and mineral and uh, metal and ice condense out of the solar nebula, the, the huge spinning cloud of gas and dust uh, from which our solar system formed. Of course, 99.999% of that became the sun. And, you know, the little tiny fragments of what's left uh, uh, constitute the planets, and 99% of that is Jupiter, right? So we're really looking at the, the sort of leftover debris from the formation of the sun. And that debris crashes into itself and grows over time. It's a process called accretion. And planets start from small worlds that are crash crashing into each other. Some of the the debris from those collisions still remains in our solar system. That's the asteroids and comets. And but most of that, most of the results of that collision are, are captured in the in the the planets that we the, the major planets and and moons and dwarf planets that we have in our solar system today. So how how did that happen? How did that process happen? And you can simulate that process in the computer using the physics and geophysics and geochemistry that we understand from. Uh, what we can measure from meteorites, what we can measure from the composition of our own planet, from moon rocks, uh, what we can infer about the interior of our planet from geophysical measurements by studying earthquakes and seismic waves. We can do that on the moon. We do that on Mars as well. So we have models, computer models, ideas for how, the, how these planets grew. And it, built into those models is is predictions of what the chemistry is going to be like. How how much iron? How much nickel? What happens when you mix this much iron and this much nickel? And does it does it cool from the inside out? Does it does it cool from the outside in? Uh, what what elements are not compatible with with iron and that gets separated out and we are going to go into the mantle instead of the core? I mean, there's a whole rich literature for decades and decades in the planetary science community that that predicts how terrestrial planets grow and form and predict certain chemistries and ratios of chemical elements like iron and nickel <clears throat> and others that would result if this model is right or that model is right. And so, you know, the whole basis of science and the scientific revolution is, is proposing hypotheses and then testing them and what's kind of been lacking in this uh, this hunt for the origins of terrestrial planets is the data to test these different models. Uh, no, no shortage of great ideas, but big shortage of great data. And so the Psyche mission is going to start to provide, you know, for the first time, real quantitative chemical abundance measurements of, of elements like iron and nickel and all the other ones I mentioned before, and, and their ratios, and maybe even their distribution across the surface. Maybe it's not homogeneous. Maybe it's, maybe it's clumpy. Uh, maybe there are places where uh, impacts since Psyche was formed have, have dumped other stuff onto the surface from other kinds of asteroids or comets. Who knows? So we'll, we'll start to get, for the first time, some real quantitative geochemical information to benchmark against those those ideas, those models, those hypotheses of how terrestrial planets form. And we, we can't do that anywhere else. We can't go and scoop a sample of the Earth's core. We can't go to the core of Mars or the moon, despite what you know Jules Verne imagined hundreds of years ago. We just can't do that uh, with today's technology, or maybe even any technology, because the pressures and temperatures are so high. So we have to you know, find another way to visit a core. And uh, here's another way. Here's the piece of a core 
of a forming protoplanet, an early baby terrestrial planet out there that we can go and study up close directly. So off the wall question. Now, this is an object that was probably part of a core, which means it probably didn't have a start out with very much uh, water ice or anything like that. You know, that's probably long gone. But afterwards, getting, you know, sustaining impacts and say this is an early object that was around, you know, in this in this form during the, you know, the late heavy bombardment or something like that. Could we look at the surface impacts of it and start getting a characterization of how much water ice and how, how much carbon was deposited on its surface early in the history of the solar system? And then maybe that might give us a picture of early Earth, right? Yeah, but that would be nice. John. It really would be nice. Uh, we probably can't do all of that that you just described. And partly it's just purely pragmatic. Uh, this mission was proposed to NASA within the smallest, lowest cost category of missions that scientists are allowed to pitch to the agency. And low cost means relatively small spacecraft. Low cost means you try to minimize the, the launch vehicle costs, partly why SpaceX was chosen. They gave, I'm sure they gave NASA a great deal. And it also means that it's not what some people think of as like a Christmas tree, right? There's not every single possible instrument that does every single possible measurement you can imagine hanging on this spacecraft. We have a very limited payload because we needed to keep costs in check and keep complexity in check and keep the development schedule short, uh, all, those, all those reasons. So, you know, we don't have, for example, a really good mass spectrometer. We don't have a mass spectrometer of any kind. On this spacecraft, we don't have a, a, a deep infrared spectrometer that could measure uh, and and detect all kinds of ices like we see all over the outer solar system, and the kinds of spectrometers that are carried on the big flagship missions like the Cassini orbiter to Saturn or the Galileo orbiter to Jupiter, etc. So we can do some of what you talked about. You know, we can use. A limited amount of color information at visible wavelengths to search for and, and near infrared wavelengths to search for and characterize the iron to silicate ratio. We can look for certain kinds of silicate rocks. Certainly if there if a comet, a small comet dumped a bunch of ice relatively recently onto the surface of Psyche, we would see that in the images. You'd see the brighter icy material against the darker, grayer, rocky and metallic background. So you know, we, we might be able to detect some of that. Uh, we don't have a good way to, to measure carbon directly on this particular mission. But if we get a good sense of the geochemistry in general for the elements, the rock forming elements that we can measure, then we can, we can in, make a better inference about the elements and minerals that we can't measure. So kind of a wishy-washy answer, I'm afraid, but uh, it really is just a, it's pragmatic works that way for every mission we do right now. But do you see this changing? Do you see that status quo changing because of dropping launch costs through SpaceX and others where we can put bigger payloads up cheaper and then we can really start making Battlestar Galactica missions that, <laughs> that are much more capable. To, do you well, think that's coming? I, don't know. It's a, I think it's a combination of, of two things will we'll make it possible to do more in the future. Not, not only dropping launch costs, but spacecraft are getting smaller, instrumentation is getting smaller, miniaturization is happening across the board on uh, space systems, including instruments. You know, we're seeing a lot of small sats, even CubeSats doing, making some spectacular kinds of measurements in, uh, in astronomy and planetary science. And uh, I think that trend is going to continue. So it, it's, it's likely to be possible to do more with less in the future rather than needing, uh, needing a Battlestar Galactica. Now, what does the chemical processes involving iron and nickel look like on a body like this, at least hypothetically what we think now? In other words, I mean, could we see things on there, you know, weird stuff like oxidation <laughs> you know, or something, something shouldn't be there? Um, is that in the cards? Is, are we set for surprises? Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great question, and we we have to 
I think we are. I think we are flexible to surprises. To to propose and win a mission with NASA, you you can't write a proposal that says, "Hey, this is cool. We don't know what we're going to see. Let's go find out." It, they, you won't get accepted, right? We have to have very specific, hypothesis-driven science that's focused on the core formation ideas and models that that we talked about earlier. But the trick then is building a system that is that does that. But that also is sensitive to the fact that nature doesn't care about our hypotheses and it's probably going to surprise us. And despite pretending like we know what we're going to see, we probably won't actually see what we think we're going to see. I mean, this has been the history of exploring our solar system, right? That's just the way the way it goes. It's delightful. So I think we do have a lot of flexibility to be able to see, like I mentioned, you know, potentially ice if there's any fresh ice there. Oxidized components certainly at visible wavelengths, uh, visible wavelength filters are very sensitive to oxidation. And we could see oxidized iron, oxidized sulfur. Again, it, it needs we need a source for that oxygen. Maybe impacts with uh, water-rich or ice-rich small asteroids or comets uh, create that environment that allows local oxidation. We want to look, be able to look close and get high resolution because maybe it's only in small isolated places, et cetera, but uh, we, we will be getting close. We will be getting, getting higher resolution and we're going to map the whole thing. So um, I think we have, we've set ourselves up to be able to detect surprises, whether we will be smart enough to know what they mean and what they're telling us. I don't know. <laughs> probably not instantly. We'll probably hopefully be just as, you know, giddy and surprised and confused as the rest of the world if we get into such a situation like that based on previous missions that have been in those situations. But uh, we've got a really good team and lots of smart colleagues and we'll figure it out. Now to to switch gears, your recent book is about the Hubble Legacy, the Hubble Space Telescope, which has been, uh, I mean, it's over 30 years at this point and just produced some of humanity's best astronomical images, although James Webb is now giving it a run for its money. What is the disconnect? In other words, so we got our money's worth out of Hubble (laughs) a thousand times over and we're still getting it. It's still producing science. And yet it was a flagship mission back in its day. And it was pushed to its greatest extent. And this has happened a lot with NASA. Of course, occasionally something crashes, but by and large, a lot of this stuff lasts longer than it, than we anticipate. You know, Mars rover lasting 10 years instead of three months, you know, that sort of thing. So what do you think the funding problem is with getting, you know, flagship missions to a bizarre object like this through? Um, is it what what's the, the sort of thinking at NASA about the risk versus the, you know, cost versus benefit and all of that yeah i mean it's it's a great question and how how much time have we got (laughs) we could go on and on um you know i think in in a a couple uh, i'll give you a couple of angles to this answer one it's a zero-sum game right i mean there's only so much discretionary government funding out there we are fortunate those of us who work with nasa in that you know, NASA's budget for civilian space activities is more than the budgets of all of the other space agencies in the world combined for civilian space. So we're in a very fortunate situation. You know, that said, it is a tiny fraction of the federal budget in the U.S. All of NASA is like 0.4 percent of the federal budget. And of course, the, the stuff that we do in solar system exploration is only some fraction of that, 15, 20 percent of that. And uh, any individual mission is only about five to ten percent of that, right? So, it's uh, it's small beans on the federal overall spending scale, but big big beans on the you know international global stage. And so the the trick is to try to do as much as we can with with the funding that we've got, and and uh, and we're all of course very very thankful for that. So NASA has to play that game in that they only get a limited amount of money to, to do all of the things that they're being asked by, uh, by the government and the taxpayers and teachers and kids and you and me to do. I, so that's one angle. Another angle to this is that they are happily, NASA is guided by the scientific community. You know, every 10 years, 
they asked the National Academy of Sciences, would you convene a panel of the best scientists around the world in planetary science, in astrophysics, in heliophysics, in earth science? Would you convene, convene a panel of 100 or so and canvas the entire community and find out what is the most important thing that NASA should be doing for the next 10 years? These are called decadal surveys. And the National Academy of Sciences said, yeah, says, yes, we'll do that. And they, they convene this, these, these austere blue ribbon panels of people from all around the world, not just the U.S. And they canvass the community and they get thousands of people uh, uh, in the rank and file to provide their inputs. And they have town halls and they, they assemble a report for NASA and Congress, by the way. And Congress pays attention to these reports because it's the National Academy of Sciences and says, hey, you know what, NASA, here's here's what's really important to learn about the solar system or about galaxies or about the sun or about the Earth using space-based missions. And NASA pays attention. And so it's not just, they're not just making stuff up, right? Not It's not like 15 people in some conference room in Washington making stuff up. They're, they're you know, looking at what is widely regarded as a consensus or as close to a consensus as you can get across these communities of experts on on how the nation should invest its its precious treasure in trying to solve these important problems scientifically and astrobiologically and you know and, and relate them to you know our own planet and our own lives in, in meaningful ways. So there's a couple of different angles to that very uh, rich question of how how this all happens how it all gets funded and who decides what uh, what missions go and do what you know though it has to be said that it, it does seem to work <laughs> you know that system well yeah it, it, it and it beats uh, the alternative of you know it's it's like a democracy it doesn't work at all except it's better than everything else right but uh, it beats the alternative of of having it just sort of be dictated by a small number of people who might not be experts uh, in uh, in these things. So uh, I'm, I'm happy with it. Well, just look at what we've learned through successive probes about Mars since Viking. Just the sheer amount of knowledge that we have about Mars is recent. <laughs> yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we had no idea that it, it was a sedimentary planet. You know, we had, we had no idea that uh, it, it had truly habitable environments from the terrestrial perspective uh, long ago and, and might even still have habitable environments in the deep subsurface today. You know, these are all discoveries of, uh, you know, taxpayer funded Mars exploration missions, all robotic up to now, but uh, the time is coming in the not too distant future when people are going to be adding to that list of explorers. I think the, I think the main one for me that blew my mind over the history from the 1970s till now was the discovery of hematite blueberries <laughs> just sitting there on the Martian surface. And, you know, I think that was opportunity that, that saw those. And it's like water, you know, there it is. <laughs> and I'm hoping I'm hoping that's what, what you find with Psyche, <laughs> something something unexpected and strange like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, the possibilities run the gamut to unexpected and strange to uh, to mundane. And who knows? Who knows what nature's going to throw at us? I doubt it's going to be mundane, uh, but uh, but we'll see. We the, the frustrating part is that we have to wait till twenty twenty nine to find out. So when is the uh, launch itself? Launch happened back in October. So the spacecraft is out there. It's on its way. October thirteenth, it was launched from uh, Kennedy Space Center on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy. Beautiful launch. The spacecraft is. Working well, systems one by one are slowly being checked out and put through the paces and calibrations and all that. And uh, we will uh, take our first images next Monday, in fact, as we check out the cameras. Ooh, so you needed a Falcon Heavy to, you know, slingshot that thing that far out there then? Well, it's actually, it's a Mars flyby. So it, it, technically it's a Mars mission <laughs> because we use the gravity of Mars to slingshot us out into the main asteroid belt. <clears throat> so we had a, a pretty, um, pretty narrow launch window and the Falcon Heavy uh, fit the bill. So any, uh, any observations planned to test the instruments and take a look at Mars during the flyby? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mars will be our first chance to look at uh, 
something that fills the fills the windshield in the cameras, if you will, and we will take advantage of that. Uh, we'll measure. Uh, we'll turn on the magnetometer. Mars doesn't have a strong magnetic field, so we might not detect anything. But we'll, you know, we'll, we'll test anyway. Uh, we'll turn on the gamma ray and neutron instruments and try to detect some of the surface composition of Mars. We'll spin the filter wheel and get color pictures of Mars, pictures of the geology of Mars and all that. We won't really advance Mars science because we're not getting that close. And we don't have instruments that haven't been used already at Mars or they're still in use at Mars. So, uh, But the, the point really will be to check everything out and make sure that for a known in quotes, object like Mars that we're, we're getting the right answer with these instruments. Now, once you get there, 2029, and you're at Psyche, how long will the mission initially last? Yeah, the intention is uh, that we'll, we'll get there and go into a very high orbit and start a, a primary mission that will last a little more than two years, about 26 months We'll start from a high orbit because we don't really know the shape and the gravity field and the mass in, in detail. So we don't know in detail until we get there how close we'll be able to get and how those low orbits will ultimately work. So we kind of creep up on the problem, start up high, do the basic high-level characterization at many tens of meters per pixel, and just get to know the place a little bit better. Make sure the spacecraft is operating properly. Of course, you know, we have to track the sun and the earth uh, as we're in orbit around this small body. That's a complex problem that we're going to have to learn how to fly this spacecraft in orbit when we, when we get there. And so uh, then we'll just over that 26 months go through four or five or six different orbital altitude phases of the mission where we drop down lower and lower. And when we get closest only something like 50 to 70 kilometers above the surface, that's when we'll get the best data with the, the gamma ray neutron instrument. That'll be our best geochemical measurements as we're, as we're very close. And of course, our highest resolution pictures of the geology. But the expectation is that we'll be probably going up and down multiple times. Psyche has seasons. Uh, it's tilted way over on its axis like the planet Uranus. And so we have to wait for the sun to rise in some parts of Psyche as it's orbiting the sun to image some parts of, of that world just because of its very, very uh, large axis tilt. Yeah, that, that's, that's the plan. Is that tilt due to whatever calamity that happened to it? Yeah, you, you, know? you tell me, right? That's a reasonable, reasonable hypothesis that uh, something, something big happened. And maybe if, if indeed... The, uh, the hypothesis is, is proven out that uh, there was a, a giant impact that stripped off the mantle and, and crust and just left the core behind, a kind of a grazing impact. And maybe that's what's responsible for that, that huge axis tilt. But, you know, why, is, why does Uranus have that tilt? Who knows? Why does Venus hardly spin on its axis? Who knows? Right? There's weirdnesses all across the solar system. There is, and there's a there's a tiny elephant in the room in that is what happened to Mercury? What stripped off so much material to leave that thing so metal rich? Yeah, yeah, there you go, right? Mercury's Mercury is almost entirely core planet, right? Exactly. You know, it'd be interesting once the Psyche mission data is in, and you know we have a good profile of this thing. Compare it to Mercury. Hmm. Because isn't Mercury the closest planetary object to these types of asteroids? Yeah, in terms of uh, sort of metal to rock ratio, that's that's absolutely right. And in fact, you know, one of the hypotheses that we'll be testing is that uh, that Psyche is not the core of a planet at all. That it's not a differentiated world. That it's a metal rich world that, like Mercury, formed very close to the sun. Uh, where the metals are condensing out of the solar nebula first as things cool. And for some reason, somehow, maybe probably through a, a giant impact of some kind, it got transported to the main asteroid belt where it is today, but that's not where it's from. And so there are, there are certain aspects to the magnetic field, to the nickel content, to the iron-nickel ratio, the ratio of other chemical elements that would be consistent with that hypothesis instead of differentiated core of a growing planetesimal. So, you know, we we, tr we did try to cover a lot of bases in our 
propose mission proposal to NASA and say, look, this is we we think it's the core of a, a planet that differentiated early, a small small planet that was that was broken up by a catastrophic and lucky impact. But maybe it's not. Maybe it's this instead. Here's another idea, right? And that that way, you know, we we set ourselves up for learning something new about a different new kind of object that we'd never seen before, no matter what its origin is. You know, if it really is a, a, a primitive world formed out of metal right from the very beginning because it just happened to be close into the sun, we'd never seen anything like that up close either, right? And there are likely other such objects in the solar system. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it's going to be fun no matter what we find. That would be crazy interesting because, you know, we look out at the outer solar system, you know, or cloud comets and Kuiper Belt objects, and we're like, well, that's pristine material from the, you know, the early days of the solar system. But it's a different type than what you would find forming right next to the sun. <laughs> and this could be a pristine example of the early solar system from a completely different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. W- wouldn't that be cool? Oh, it's going to be great. Now, you gave a TED Talk about leaving Earth, in other words, becoming a multi-planet species and, you know, spreading our wings and heading out into the universe as best we can. Do you think we're on the right track with the events of the last 20 years and the rise of SpaceX? Do you think we're on the right track for that more so than we were, say, in 1995? Well, certainly uh, you mentioned launch costs earlier. I mean, the, 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 the ability to, to recycle your main booster is a uh, you know, fundamental paradigm shift in uh, in launch, and uh, and other companies will be doing that too, and other nations will be doing that too, not just SpaceX. So, it's been revolutionarily lowering launch costs, and that's that's part of the obstacle, right? Part of the obstacle to becoming a a more multi planet species is just it's so expensive to do, and uh, it's not it's something typically that only governments have been able to afford. Because it's expensive, because there's no profit in it, uh, the only the profit realized by our taxpayer investment in NASA is knowledge, new technologies that trickle down into the the rest of of our lives, uh, national pride, things like that. That's that's the profit. But of course, uh, individuals who want to run a company or companies that want to uh, get people out into space, they're not going to be happy with the uh, you know, hey, we just rewrote the textbook. You know, no, their investors and shareholders are going to want money. And so, in order for this uh, this whole enterprise to be profitable, you got to bring the costs down to the to the scale that that companies can be formed to send tourists into space or to launch astronauts to the space station or to send astronauts to the moon and make some money in the process of doing it. So, I think we're starting to see a space economy form that will ultimately lead, and I'm an optimist, of course, will ultimately lead to settlement and and people living and and working on other worlds. Um, Right now, most of the space economy is based on communication satellites, right? That's where the money is is made. But that even that's changing as as the communication satellite world starts to diversify and you know, Starlink and OneWeb and all these clusters of huge numbers of small sats are starting to come online soon. And so the whole the whole fabric of the the communication satellite industry and the, the, the telecom industry in general is, is changing and getting smaller and lower cost. Um, so, you know, the, the economic sphere of the earth extends beyond the surface of the earth now. And Soon, in the decades ahead, will probably ex- extend to the moon, um, and you know there, there'll be a lunar economy that will be based on tourism, scientific exploration, government-funded, and resource extraction on the moon. I'm sure, and then it's only a matter of time once we demonstrated that that uh, we can move out even further, and the sort of the Earth's economy will encompass the solar system at some point in the centuries ahead. So what about beyond? What about um, eventually, you know, building a huge, uh, what was it, Project Daedalus or whatever it was, you know, nuclear detonation propulsion and stuff like that and head to Alpha Centauri? Yeah. You know, this is right now it's the realm of science fiction. And it's fun to think about. But uh, if you if you do 
believe that uh, that we have a destiny as a spacefaring species. And and look, there's lots of people that don't believe that. Uh, but if you believe it, if you're an optimist, if you think that technology can solve the problems of the extreme environmental conditions that we're going to be having to experience, then why not, right? Then, then why not uh, bring visionaries and generational scale visionaries in into the mix? Certainly, I hope that the, uh, the future history of the settlement of of space uh, diverges from the, you know, often sad history of the settlement of new lands on our own planet, displacement of indigenous populations and all that. That's uh, you know not not been a particularly glorious history, right? Um, I think we, we have a chance to do it better. I think we have a chance to do it in maybe a more unified planetary way. We're not there. <laughs> We're not there as a species right now. You know, in some. Some science fiction versions of the future will never be there. Other science fiction versions of the future we will get there within a few centuries. I guess it's uh, it's uh, it's Battlestar versus Star Trek, right? Uh, I'm a I'm a disciple of Gene Roddenberry. I believe in that kind of a future. I'm that kind of a optimist. Some of my friends call me a hopeless optimist that way, but I think we can do that, and I think it's going to require the um, the collective neurons of the many uh, cultures and societies on our planet to, to pool together and survive. There's also a practical reason though, you know, space travel is hard and it's dangerous. So you need everybody, <laughs> you know, you need everybody on the same page and all hands on deck and building the Star Trek world, which we'll probably never get to that point because of lack of warp drive, <laughs> you know, things like that. But whatever we do like it needs to be done that way just just for survival you know you need you need everyone and um we need to get the idea that when we go to space we become the humans not nation states the humans and that's the way it will work i hope um but then again you get you know <laughs> then you get into the the martians and the earthlings <laughs> fighting about stuff <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. No, look, we're going to take we're going to take our faults with us, of course, as we go out there. But, uh, you know, I try to I tell my own my students in my classes, you know, it's not just going to be scientists and, and engineers who go out there. You know, we need we need lawyers and we need cops and we need dancers and we need poets and we need people who, you know, are going to cook the meals and you know i mean it's going to take all kinds of people across the entire range of our civilization to to make it work if it can work in space and the other thing too is cultural you know um you could imagine a situation where where you know one culture may not be as good as another human culture at being in space you know one may be more psychologically suited for it based on their experience so you need you need to take all of that with you as well and apply what you you know what we've learned over the last 250,000 years collectively <laughs> to a new existence in space yeah i love the fact that there's now a, a sort of a burgeoning field of sort of space law and space politics you know how how will these settlements govern themselves what what kind of government will they choose you know is it is it obvious that a democracy is the is the answer for a bunch of people in a in an extreme environment like that? I mean, who knows, right? But people are smart. People are starting to think about these things, and how will um, how how will these these new civilizations grow and learn from the successes and the failures of the past? Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You knew Carl Sagan early on, right? Well, so. Part of the reason I'm, I'm in this business is because of the original Cosmos TV series in 1980. M many of my colleagues of my generation were profoundly influenced by that show. I try to scare the heck out of my students and my kids and say, imagine a world where that only had three TV networks plus PBS and hardly any science on any of them. Nova was around, right? Nova's been around forever. It's a great show. Still around. And then along comes this guy who is is talking about astronomy and and planetary science, and he's got a funny Brooklyn accent and a coat with uh, the elbow patches that professors wear. And 
and but he's speaking English, you know, to the the, the teenage me and many others in my generation, and and, and a, other adults at the time. He's just speaking common common English without all the jargon and all that, and just uh, was great. It was a, just an eye opening experience to interact in quotes with a scientist that way through television. And then I had the I had the good amazing fortune to to be in the same field and we corresponded on some telescopic observations that I had worked on in graduate school. <laughs> and then we were, uh, we were colleagues for a short while at, at Cornell when I started on the faculty there, uh, in the early nineties. So yeah, it was a, it was a, a real thrill, a real delight to get to interact with them professionally. Yeah. Cosmos changed everything. It, 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 you know, Again, you were right. I remember Nova in those days, 1980. But Cosmos was what really imprinted on me because, you know, I was five years old and I actually could understand it, <laughs> you know, or understand some of it. And it was it was definitely landmark. But there was actually another one. Do you remember James Burke and Connections? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Connections. And he'd go, it takes us here. And then he'd pop up in the Scottish Highlands or something like that, right? Yeah, that was yeah, that was that was another one. That, yes, yes, that was, and he's actually still around, believe it or not. Yeah, um, oh, yeah. Wow, so, wow. so what's next? All right, we get psyche the psyche mission. We learn what's the step further to look f- even more into these iron asteroids. What what sort of mission can you plan past that? You know, like a sample return, perhaps. Yeah, I think I think Psyche will will set the stage for sort of deeper in situ exploration of smaller metallic asteroids that are closer to the Earth. They whiz by all the time. None of them are impact threats directly, but they get close enough that it's relatively easy in quotes, relatively easy to send a, a, a probe there to rendezvous with one like the OSIRIS-REx mission did recently, like the the Japanese Hayabusa mission did with other kinds of asteroids. It's just a matter of uh, getting the the mission in the right cost box and and resource box and uh, teams pitching it to NASA or NASA deciding based on decadal surveys, this is an important thing for us to start uh, as a, a larger scale mission. Uh, and it might also be something that uh, the human exploration side gets into as well. There's There have been concepts for decades for asteroid return missions that involve astronauts. There are certain asteroids that come close enough to the Earth that they're easier to get to gravitationally than the moon. And so, you know, and it, we know of like 30,000 near-Earth asteroids now, and that number is just going up and up and up every year. And, uh, and so uh, the opportunities for even for human missions to, uh, to close by potentially resource rich asteroids are just going to increase over time. So I, I think those are the kinds of next steps that that can be enabled by a mission like Psyche. If given the chance as as things unfold to literally go there yourself, would you would you actually go to Psyche if uh, we built a, a huge space economy that allowed for it? Well, look, I mean, I'm I'm uh, I would love to go to lots of destinations in the solar system. I want to go to Mars. I would love, love to skim through the clouds of Venus, right? I'd love to uh, be able to have a wonderful dinner inside the rings of Saturn. Wouldn't that be delightful? You know, all these, lots of places to go. Um, I, I want to come back just to get straight, get that straight. I don't want to make it a one-way trip. I'd love to come back. Earth is my favorite planet. I love all these other planets, but Earth is my favorite because I've lived here most of my life and most of my friends are from here, so definitely want to come back. But I think there's enormous potential for both scientific and uh, just sort of experiential tourism kind of exploration of the solar system for people in the future. Uh, there's a f- spectacular uh, short film called The Wanderers. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, gosh, I can't remember the, the author's name right now, but the, the filmmaker's name. But um it's uh, it's it's online. It's called Wanderers, and it takes images from Voyager and Galileo and other famous uh, space missions, and and he puts people in those places at the right scale, and uh, it just imagines you know people floating through the clouds of, of Jupiter, or ho- hovering above the surface of Venus in a in a dirigible. Or, uh, or walking across the surface of Europa with Jupiter in the background. I mean, it's just uh, 
Eric Vernquist, that's his name, Eric Vernquist. It's called Wanderers, and it's just a wonderful little film, and it's got、uh, Carl Sagan's narration from Pale Blue Dot、uh, over the、uh, the visuals. So it's、uh, check it out. It, it's what I imagine、uh, a couple of hundred years from now, a potential future with people in space being like. All right, Jim. We are out of time. Where can everybody find your books? Uh, well, uh, one can go to Amazon and search for me under the Amazon authors list. I have a, a website that's、uh, jimbell. c s e s e School of Earth and Space Exploration, jimbell. s e s e. a s u. e d u, where I have my books listed there as well. Most、uh, Barnes and Nobles carry、uh, a lot of my books as well because of the publishers I've worked with. All right. Well, I hope you'll come back as the mission unfolds and keep us posted as to、uh, what's happening with the Psyche mission. It should be exciting, whatever we find. <laughs>